We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. How's it going? It's going. Yeah. Had a big weekend? Yeah. Maybe. Nudge, nudge. Yeah. You can save it for a good thing. Okay. Hmm. Well, this week's episode, it isn't the one that I originally had on the docket. On the master docket? On the master docket, which I looked the other day. Guess how many years worth of story ideas I have on there? At least five. A little over seven. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Yeah. It means you're finding, you're finding cool stories and we don't have to repeat anything. This is true. That's a good way of looking at it. I was just like, at some point I need to stop. No. <laughs> I think it's really cool that you're able to find all these novel stories. Seven years worth. Like, that's really mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. We'll see if we're still. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. My allergies are really bad, so I'm making, like, horrible faces to my sister as I try not to sneeze. They're pretty great. Anyway. So with that in mind, <laughs> this week we are going to be talking about Margaret Dixon. Okay. That's a very common white lady name mm -hmm. from back in the day. Mm -hmm. This could be anybody. It could be anybody. Oh, dang. This is Somebody. an interesting story indeed. <laughs> Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2022 Surgeon's Hall Museum blog post. 2021 Edinburgh Live article by, it's either Kate or Katie Welsh. It's K-A-I-T-E. So I'm just going to say both. Kate slash Katie Welsh. 2020 Random Times article by Leo S. 2020 Spooky Isles article by Taste Doris. 2018 Vintage News article by Stefan Andrews. 2016 The Scotsman article, My Macabre Road Trip blog post. That was kind of a fun site. Murderpedia, the National Library of Scotland, the Word on the Street blog, <laughs> the Grass Market, and Undiscovered Scotland article. Is the Word on the Street a, a Scottish blog? Yeah, it's like they dive into broadsides. Cool. So they take like the the one pagers that would be printed about a trial and execution and stuff, and they like dive into it's it. Cool. That's the Word on the Street. That's the word on the street. Broadsides and dead people. <laughs> Hell yeah. Which is cool. I may have to dive into that more in the future. Absolutely. Earmark that and find another year's worth of stories. <laughs> there you go. Why is everything Scottish this year? Don't question it's it. the year of the Scots. <laughs> Just go with it. <laughs> and links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. Awesome. If you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. Margaret, or Maggie, was born in Musselburgh in 1702, which is okay. roughly five miles from Edinburgh. That would have been a good distance at that time. Yeah, half a day's travel probably. Yeah. Maybe, eh, maybe less if you're traveling by horse. Mm -hmm. No. I'm guessing like I know. Right. Or if you're a small child and you have a wheel and stick. And you're <laughs> <after it. laughs> a hoop and stick. A hoop and stick. <laughs> she hoop and sticked her way all the way to Edinburgh. <laughs> what a scamp. <laughs> yep. Although not much is known about her childhood, which is a common thing with women mm -hmm. during this time in history. It is believed that she was raised in a strict Christian household. I wasn't sure what denomination of Christianity it was, but Christian. 
Also very common of the time. Yep. In general. Many of the people who lived and worked in Musselburgh were employed as either fishermen, gardeners, or they made salt. Oh! From like, are, are they by the sea at all? Mm-hmm. Nice. That would be an interesting profession, making salt. It would be. I wonder how intensive that is. And how hygienic it was. Yeah. And or is now. My skin is so dry. Man. But also so pure. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Clear. So pure clear. (laughs) I'm fully detoxed, but so dry. As you can probably guess, the bulk of these wares were sold in nearby Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And it was the woman's job to sell the products in the city. So she did go by hoop and stick to the city. She totally did. (laughs) As she was dragging a wagon behind her. Right. In 1723, Maggie, now in her early 20s, married a fisherman and salt vendor named Patrick Spence, and the matter of his leaving her alone has been highly contested. Okay, leaving her alone. Like, leaving her? Yeah. Okay. Like, going away. (laughs) Yeah. Great. So some versions of her story state that he was forced to work for the Royal Navy on, like, a warship. Would make sense. And, like, isn't this about the time where they would just, like, kidnap dudes all the time? Probably. And they're like, you're a part of the military now. <laughs> you're a part of this pirate ship. In the Navy. <laughs> we just I took you from your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Other versions claim he went to work with a fishing fleet in Newcastle, which is also yeah. entirely possible. Making money. While yet other claims state that he just simply abandoned her. Uh, Also, fair could happen, unfortunately. Yep. So all three are kind of plausible. You know who knows? Robert Stack from Unsolved Mysteries. (laughs) Totally, he's the only one who knows why why the man has like four families. Yep. He knows. R.I.P. It was noted that the pair had two children together that Maggie also had to care for following the disappearance of her husband. But I don't know if I believe that. Yeah. If that was the case, then she must have left them with family or friends in order for the rest of her story to play out how it's been told and make sense. Yeah. So, and it was really only noted in like, two of my sources that she had two children okay i'm not gonna say that she didn't it's entirely possible that she did Mm -hmm. it wasn't uncommon for women to leave their children in the care of other families while they went off to work and make a living so yep i left it in to play devil's advocate okay entirely possible but who knows who knows only Robert Stack. <laughs> Not me. Only Robert. <laughs> do, 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 do. I know where those <laughs> kids really are. <laughs> no matter what version you choose to believe, <laughs> while he was away, Maggie was left to fend for herself. She ended up finding employment at an inn in the small borough of Kelso in the Scottish borders okay. as a barmaid, where she was able to work to receive basic lodgings. I feel like that was also common. Mm-hmm. For a lot of women, working women, mm-hmm. like even second and third jobs, too. Like, if you work here, we'll let you sleep here. Mm-hmm. Got a sleeping job, and you got a, a money job. Mm-hmm. It was there that she gained the attention of the innkeeper's son, William Bell. Uh, and even though he was younger than her, he soon seduced Maggie, resulting in her becoming pregnant at the age of 22. Now we know where the kids come in. Womp womp. Womp womp. The following is a quote from a broadside published about Maggie and her life. Quote, In Scotland, every woman who was guilty of fornication was obliged to sit on a seat in the most conspicuous place in the church. Three different Sundays, when she received a public rebuke from the minister. What the hell? And so much were the women intimidated at the disgrace that many of them destroyed the fruits of their amours rather than be made a spectacle to all the inhabitants of a parish, end quote. So what does that mean, destroy 
all aspects of their amours, all the all their loves. Get rid of the babies. Oh, <gasps> so the church was more okay with abortion than no, no, no. So these women were more okay with like hiding a pregnancy and getting rid of the evidence than to be caught fornicating and being publicly disgraced in the church. Sounds like right now, lol. <laughs> Dark. Womp womp. <laughs> Man, that's awful. Yeah. They just had to sit in a seat and have the minister be like, you suck. Yeah. Whore. <laughs> Boo, <laughs> you much. whore. <laughs> Pretty much. And then he'd hang up the phone on her and she'd be like, what? All of the ministers were Virginia George. Yeah. Were you all Virginia George? Even though she did her best to conceal the pregnancy, it wasn't long before some of her neighbors accused her of being pregnant. Uh-oh. She was desperate to hide it from the innkeeper in order to keep her job, which makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense, especially if it's his son. He doesn't want his son having a bad reputation for yep. whatever reason. When she did give birth, it's believed that it was premature, and it's unclear if the child was stillborn or died shortly after, as some sources say it only lived for a few days. I mean, if she was under that much stress about worried about Losing her home, finding out if she was getting pregnant, that would make sense. Like, high amounts of stress. Yeah. Yep. Potentially cause that. That's too bad. Yeah. Either way, the body of the child was discovered on the banks of the River Tweed, where oh. Maggie later confessed she had intended to throw it into the river, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Some sites claimed that she had put it in the river, but that it washed back onto shore further downstream, where it was discovered and later tied back to her. Mm. So, again, this is one of those stories where it's like there's so many different variations of it, but like the core okay. part of it is the same. Yeah. It could also be that it was such a traumatic thing for her, she honestly has no idea what she did. Yep. Maggie soon found herself arrested on suspicion of fornication and infanticide. Oh, and was no. placed in the old Tolbooth jail in Edinburgh to await trial, although it's also postulated that she was held in Carlton jail, which, I mean, there's only is, one source that said that, so. Is there is there one that's, like, more evil than the other? Well, old Tolbooth was the one that most people would go to in Edinburgh, so okay. I'm I'm more inclined to believe that she was at old Tolbooth. Okay. Some sources stated that she was to be tried under the 1690 Concealment of Pregnancy Act, but it is more likely that it was for the murder of her child. Yeah, they'd want to go for the harshest sentence. Yep. So the Concealment of Pregnancy Act, or the Scottish Act Anent Murthering of Children, was put into place so juries could convict women and have them put to death for hiding their pregnancies and the birth of said illegitimate children that would go on to die. That's really fucked up. Yep. It didn't matter if the child was stillborn or passed naturally shortly after birth, the mother would still be convicted of murder and put to death. Essentially, it was created to prevent abortion and extramarital sex. And we all know how well those work. Yep. In general. Especially I mean, no, we don't. In cities, highly populated areas. Yep. The body of the baby, which was reported as being a son, was examined by a surgeon. And after he conducted an experiment in which he placed a small amount of water in the lungs, it was concluded that the child had been alive when it was born and that Maggie had killed it by drowning it. Ugh. Okay. So this test was said to have shown that his lungs swimmed which is something that happens if breath had been drawn prior to death, thereby yeah, showing he... that it wasn't a stillbirth or a late-term abortion. Yeah, but he could have still taken a breath and died. Yeah. Again. This information that was presented to the all-male jury was given as a way to show she had murdered her child somehow, even though there were no external or assault marks to be found on the infant. It was like shoddy evidence at best. Mm -hmm. But it didn't matter because there are all these laws in place to put the ultimate shame and punishment. 
Mm -hmm. Further evidence was brought forth against her, including witness testimony from neighbors that accused her of being pregnant, which she continued to deny, as well as the fact that the body of the child was found near where Maggie lived. Upon examination, it was also brought into evidence that Maggie herself bore signs of having recently given birth, which, I mean... It's kind of hard to hide. That's kind of hard to hide that when you're bleeding profusely. Yeah. It didn't take long for the jury to come back with a verdict of guilty on August 6th, 1724, and she was sentenced to hang the following month. That's so awful. During her time at Old Tollbooth as she awaited her execution... Maggie was repentant, admitting that yes, she had broken her wedding vows by committing the crime of fornication, but she was adamant that she had not harmed her child or had any intention of harming it. Mm. When asked why she attempted to conceal her pregnancy, she stated that it was in an effort to avoid public example and persecution in the church. Mm -hmm. Which would be a good motivator at that point. Yep. Mm -hmm. When asked, Maggie stated that she went into labor quite suddenly and earlier than normal, and the extreme pain that she endured prevented her from asking for help during the unplanned birth. She went on to say that she was so out of sorts by the pain that she had no recollection of what actually became of the baby, if it had indeed been born already dead or if it had passed shortly after. That's awful. That's awful. And doing all of that alone, and you're so scared, and you have no idea what's right, like what's actually happening versus what you're hallucinating from the pain. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Margaret was brought to the gallows at Grass Market on September 2nd, 1724, where she was hanged at the age of 23 for the murder of her child out of wedlock in front of court officials, church members, family, and looky-loos, as they all are. When she was cut down and placed into the wooden pauper's coffin, her body was put into the care of friends who planned to take her back to Musselboro for burial. There were reports that following her hanging, her family had to fight with medical students in order to claim her body and bring it home for burial. Yeah, because this was a time when they needed cadavers. Versus it being taken to the medical school for dissection. Mm -hmm. This story has been debunked by the Surgeon's Hall Museum, which noted that as there was only one medical college in Edinburgh at the time, there wasn't such a huge demand for cadavers, as there would be over 100 years later during the time of Burke and Hare. Yeah, I don't know. I also feel like they'd, they'd feel more entitled to criminal bodies. It would be more apt to try. Well, and I mean, that's kind of what they would go for anyway. They typically yeah. would get the mur- the bodies of criminals. But I'm sure because she had family there that were claiming her, it was more of like a, well, I guess we can't Fine. have this one. Because yeah. most criminals, at least at that time, family didn't want to claim their bodies. So those yeah. were the ones that they were like, these ones are ours. Yoink. We're going to take it. Along the way, the men who were in charge of transporting her stopped at the village of Peffermill, just a couple miles outside Edinburgh, to grab some food and drink, leaving the cart with the coffin by the door of the establishment. Okay. While they were eating, one of the men swore that he saw the lid of the coffin begin to move, in addition to hearing something rattling around inside. Absolutely not. Once he removed the lid... Maggie immediately sat up, which caused the whole company to exclaim in fear, except for her father, Duncan, who embraced her in joy, because she's back from the dead, you know? Yeah, but that also could be rigor mortis. (laughs) About an hour or so later, she was feeling well enough to be able to sleep at the inn before traveling by foot back to Musselboro the following morning. This is super fucked. It's believed that the jostling of the coffin during the ride back to Musselboro helped stir her back to consciousness, in addition to her being able to breathe thanks to the shoddy production of the pauper's coffin itself, which was poorly made and had multiple gaps that let in air. So they 
hanged her to just being unconscious. They didn't actually check to see if she, she was fully dead. Yes. It didn't snap her neck. Oh, man, this is a roller coaster. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Okay. You may be wondering, okay, so did she have to go back to jail? Because she's still alive. No, I wasn't. I wasn't wondering that. I was hoping they'd, like, move her to the highlands or something. I don't know. <laughs> she, like, lived her cottagecore life. Well, in Scottish law, which is built on the principles of the Roman Pandex, okay. notes that once a person has received judgment from the court and been executed, they can no longer suffer for their crimes and are therefore absolved of them. Her surviving the noose was seen as God's will. Oh, hell yeah. Additionally, once a person has died, their marriage is automatically terminated. Hell yeah. Okay. So she's like cleared of everything. So she was better off dead. <laughs> yeah. And she couldn't be tried again. It was kind of like ye old double jeopardy. Like you can't be yeah. tried for the same crime, the same crime twice. God said, no, nah, you're good. Go back. You're good, girl. Following her death and miraculous resurrection, Maggie could not be tried again for the supposed crime of murder and, in fact, went on to remarry her husband, with whom she went on to have several legitimate children. I, why would you go back to him? I mean... Well, maybe he didn't leave then. Yeah, maybe he was in the Navy. Maybe he was in the Navy or the or like a fishing boat for a long period of time. And she yeah. thought that he died at sea and then he didn't. And he was like, I thought you were dead too. And they fell in love. And they were like, we're both not dead. Let's get, let's get married. Starring Gerard Butler and a really pretty brunette. Who would be a good Maggie? Natalie Portman would be a good Maggie. Yeah, but I can't see Natalie Portman and Gerard Butler being romantic interests. Yeah, but... It's gotta be somewhat <laughs> believable. I mean, did they really marry for love to that time? I don't know. Maybe she did. He was the fish what if it's, of her dreams. Uh, the, one of the doc Doctor Who actors. Like? Not Matt Smith. I feel like her husband needs eyebrows. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I don't watch enough Doctor Who to... If it was... Michael Sheen? Oh, I can see that. I can see that. He's a little right. old for her, but I can see that. Jensen Ackles? Is that his name? From Supernatural? Oh, the Supernatural guy? But could he pull off a Scottish accent? I don't know, but with a face that pretty, does he need to? I suppose he wouldn't be in the movie that much. He'd be like, I'm going off to war. And then On a like, ship. <laughs> and then like, I'm back. And you're back from the dead. He does look good in a beard. If you've seen the boys, he looks good in a full beard. Anyway, back onto the topic of uh, <laughs> the real Maggie, not the the movie not Maggie. Really Portman as Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> the other supernatural guy could be the the uh, innkeeper's son, William Bell. Yeah. Oh, I don't know enough about supernatural. And that, that's how you tie them in. I feel like they're always in stuff together. That's how they can be together again. Mm. Anyway, Maggie gave birth to a son named James Spence 10 months after her trial. So, oh, oh. Hmm. so she like knocked boots as soon as she got home. Yeah. In order to make that work and <laughs> ran an alehouse in Berwick, Scotland for several years, at least until as late as 1753, at which point she would have been 51. Dang. It's a long life for somebody who tried to get hung. <laughs> yep. Well, she didn't try to. I know. Someone else tried to do it. <laughs> yeah. Who survived being hung? So how did she survive the hangman's noose? During the preparations for her execution, John Dogleash, who was the <laughs> <laughs> what? Dogleash. Yep. Dogleash. Okay. Fitting for a noose maker. Right. It's not spelled like dogleash. It's Dalgleish. No, it's Dalgleish. But yeah, it sounds like Dalgleish. Who was the infamous hangman in charge of Maggie's execution, forgot to tie her hands. So it's believed she attempted to loosen the noose about her neck. Interesting. The members of the crowd saw what she was doing and threw a few stones at John, 
to prevent her from actually succeeding in freeing herself. Like, dude, what the fuck? That's Do so your funny job. They, <laughs> they threw it at him. They're just like, dude, do your gonna, job. I thought they were going to throw stones at her. Like, hey, knock it off. You're supposed to be dead. <laughs> This is supposed to be a clean hanging. <laughs> she was then hanged for the standard length of time, which is 30 minutes, apparently. That's the standard length. Awful. Before she was cut down and put in the charge of her family. And we know how that goes. Yep. A local broadside shared words that I'm assuming they took the liberty with, once you hear them, in which John Dogleash remembered Maggie prior to his death. Mm-hmm. And this is something that apparently were some of his last words. Of course. And you'll you'll get why I feel like there was some liberty once I mm-hmm. share them. Quote, I'll cry as fuo tears an egg. Death I've a favor for to beg. That ye wad only gie a flag. And spare my life as I did to ill hanged Meg, that graceless wife. End quote. Yeah, okay, later, dude. Have fun and die. People don't speak in poems. No. Sorry. They tend not to when they're trying to continue to breathe. Yeah. yeah. And think to themselves, what rhymes with egg? <laughs> <laughs> Try and think of what rhymes with Meg all day. <laughs> they don't tend to write a limerick before they die. Right. Anyway, as an aside, several changes were made in Scottish law regarding the death penalty in 1790 about 66 years after Maggie's quote-unquote death at the gallows. Mm -hmm. One such change was the legal vocabulary surrounding hangings. At the time that Maggie was tried, the verdict just read that she was to be hanged. It wasn't until much later that the language was changed to read as hanged until dead. Yeah. Important distinction. That is a very important distinction. One you wouldn't think you needed to do. Yep. Until stuff like this happened. Yep. And as an extra fun fact, 1790 was also the year that hangings replaced burning at the stake as the official method of capital punishment for acts of treason. Well, that's great for... No one. That... <laughs> no one wins. Yay. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Except for maybe, maybe people's noses and lungs. People in the timber industry. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> no more deforestation. It shouldn't surprise you to learn that Maggie's survival and escape from death made her a bit of a local celebrity and earned her the moniker of Half Hang It Maggie. Cute. But she loved that. I'm sure she did. Rumors circulated that she survived because she was good friends with the rope maker that had provided the rope for the noose, and her earlier actions messing on it are what allowed her to survive the sudden drop. I mean, if you got friends in good places and you don't deserve to die because your baby died naturally, Mm -hmm. I think it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. The following information should be taken with a grain of salt and maybe some fish if that's kind of what your line of trade is. (laughs) Fish and chips. (laughs) Fish and chips. But even though Maggie wasn't particularly religious, it said that following her miraculous survival, she would dedicate one day each week typically Wednesdays, to fasting and prayer for the remainder of her life. I mean, I would. Yeah, why not? It worked. The exact date of her passing is unknown, but it is believed that she passed sometime after 1753. Some sources said she lived 40 years following her brush with death, which would make her around 63 at the time of her final passing in 1765. Which is super old back then. So That's old. a good life. Mm-hmm. All things considered. Especially if she like ran her own alehouse until she was 51. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maggie's legacy lives on at the Maggie Dixon's Pub, which is conveniently located in Edinburgh's Grass Market District and overlooks the spot where she was, quote unquote, executed. Nice. And that is the story of Half Hang It Maggie. Dang. That's quite a story. Right? Dang. That's actually one that it was on my list of stories to do. But then my sister-in-law, Lena, reminded me of it when she went to Scotland for work. And she was like, oh, my God, have you heard of this story? And I kind of knew what it was about. Yeah. 
but I didn't know the full extent of was what it was about, like why she was put on trial and hung in the first place. Yeah, it's all bad. It's all bad. But... It's all bad. Ends okay. But it's very interesting. I mean, yeah. I'm glad they reacted positively instead of like, it could have easily backfired that she was like a witch or a vampire and they would have like made her super dead. Yeah, I was (laughs) like, oh God, you're going to think she's a vampire. Put a steak in her mouth or whatever. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Way to go, Meg. Way to go. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes or over on our link tree to get started today. That is so fucked up. It's fucked up. I'm so fucked up. It is just so damn fucked up. That's fucked up. This is That's So Fucked Up, a podcast about cults, murder, and other fucked up stuff. Like, really, really fucked up stuff. He cut off her nipples, tore out her heart, tied it to a rope and hung it on the wall. After spending three years really tapping into her divine feminine, she finds out she's divine masculine. That's a mind fuck. Yeah. How yeah. much of a mind fuck is that? Fucking sharks ate Mark under the dinghy. After his dad dies, he fucking marries all his dad's oh, wives. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. He like marries all his stepmoms. <laughs> There was this egg thing where you line up like seven or eight guys side by side. They lay on their backs with their eyes closed and whoever is like the alpha in the room, they crack an egg into that person's mouth and then they pass the egg mouth to mouth until they get to the end of the line. And then the last person has to swallow the egg. Ugh. Are they, and they're naked? Did you say that? Uh, it didn't say if they were naked. Okay, I just feel like they probably but they could are. could be. We're your hosts. I'm Ashley Richards. And I'm Michelle Mosher. Join us on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, and everywhere you listen to podcasts. That's fucked up. This week's podcast plug is the That's So Fucked Up podcast. Very fitting. Fitting. (laughs) Super fitting. That's So Fucked Up is a podcast about cults, murder, and other generally fucked up stuff. Hosts Ashley Richards and Michelle Mosher bring you enthralling yet horrifying stories while looking at their possible causes. Join the gals as they discuss what inspires people to do the awful things that they do. Nature? Nurture? Society? Let's investigate from our couches together. New episodes every fucked up Friday. Ash and Michelle also have a bi-weekly segment called Binge or Bust, where Ash breaks down a doc for Michelle, since she loves watching them. But watching Mm -hmm. docs alone gives Michelle anxiety. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. And Ashley just released a spinoff series as well, That's So Fucked Up Presents, a show where she explores a different location or topic over the course of each month. The first season is on four of Colorado's most notorious murders and is called Colorado Carnage. Nice. And we will have a link to That's So Fucked Up in the show notes. What is something good you'd like to share? I got to see you and hang out and it was super fun. We did. We got to be sisters this weekend. We did. My fiancé is out of town, and I have this nice apartment surrounded by good food, and it's quiet with no children, just two neurotic dogs and a cat that smells and screams sometimes. And And sometimes likes to sleep on your ribs. Yes, and put all her weight right on one leg in between them to show dominance while you sleep. But yeah, we got to hang out and we got to make you dinner and it was fun. We got to be lazy bums and it was really nice. It was nice. Mm -hmm. And we got to watch a modern crime documentary. 
I know. I was telling Maddie when I was over, I don't watch a lot of true crime documentaries. I am so behind. Like, people will mention a true crime documentary and I'll have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, what? And the one we watched was All the Way Down. Is that what it was called? The Way Down. The Way Down. About the remnant church Mm -hmm. and the lady with the crazy high hair full of secrets. Yep. Shamblin. Something Shamblin. Gwen. Gwen Shamblin. That was interesting. Yeah. A little more culty at first than true crime, but then it it became, it was crime. It was all crimes. Yeah, it was all bad. Throughout the entire thing, there were a lot of parallels between what was going on in that cult, because it's a cult, let's just be, let's be honest, and The Righteous Gemstones, which is a show on HBO Max, (laughs) that if you have not watched, I highly recommend you check it out. I mean, Mm -hmm. it'll make you really angry, but it's also really funny. Yeah. It'll make you angry at how... It's based on stuff that has actually happened. Stuff that actually happens Mm -hmm. in regards to religion, and it's just gross. Yeah. And it's something oftentimes you don't recognize as being gross until somebody points it out. Yep. And then you're like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that sucked. That's not great. And you had no idea. Or you had an inkling, but you didn't know just how, to what extent it was. And then you're just like, how are we as a society still this a thing? Because yeah. we're so dumb. Anyway, it was good. Yeah. We had ramen. We had wine. Mm-hmm. We had... I made I made you butter chicken empanadas. They were good. Mm-hmm. And... We had donuts. We had all the donuts. Mm-hmm. And sushi. That sushi was really good. I haven't had that type of sushi before. It's good. Yeah, I really like that place. That incidentally is the place that put us in the corner when we tried to eat in person in Uptown that one time because oh. of Willie. And I was, and I never, like, I always thought it was a cultural thing. I don't think they meant to be dicks about it. I think they were just like, this is a dog in the restaurant, and you're telling me that I have to let this dog in the restaurant, but we don't need somebody reporting us that there's a dog in the restaurant i don't know i never i didn't take it as personally as i probably should or could have i took it very personal on your behalf i I was very angry they have good food they they have good food and they do but fuck those guys now that you're reminded (laughs) of that fuck those guys oh no okay we can pick so i'm not going to say what the place was but their Mm -hmm. uptown location can fuck right off. Generally, in uptown, can fuck right off. Yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're interested in ad-free content, consider supporting us with a one-time donation either over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. If you'd like early ad-free content, not to mention some bonus material, become a member of our Patreon today for as low as a dollar a month. Anyway. <laughs> On that note, a great way to support the show, if you want to help out but can't do so financially, is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods. You can leave ratings on Spotify or wherever you listen to our podcasts. Mm-hmm. This week's review is, again, a screenshot. I do not know who wrote it, so I apologize. I think it is from Apple Podcasts, and it says, quote, one of the most bingeable podcasts out there in any genre. If you love bizarre and macabre history and hilarious hosts, this is a drop everything must listen now show. So nice. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Facebook and Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. On TikTok, of course you are. Follow us at Yield Crime Podcast. I don't know when our next sale <laughs> is at Tee Public, but we do have two new merch designs mm-hmm. that will be live by the time this episode comes out. They're not live right this second, but they will be. And mm-hmm. I encourage you to go check them out because I think you'll like them. 
Me too. I liked them. I thought they were cool. Mm-hmm. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.